Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us. In February, the United Nations Human Rights Committee published a list of 112 companies that profit from the Israeli occupation on Palestinian and Syrian land. Now, the colonization of occupied territory and the exploitation of property and people in that territory is prohibited by the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention. It's interesting to note that that convention was prompted these international rules were prompted because of the Nazi theft and exploitation of Jewish land and property in large part. The companies listed by the UN are all involved in activity benefiting from this illegal occupation and colonization of Palestinian land. That makes them complicit in a war crime. What will that mean? We're going to talk about. The original list of companies was researched and completed three years ago, but it wasn't published because of pressure from the United States and Israel to prevent the UN from releasing the original findings and data. Now the list has finally been published, but many companies known for their role in assisting the occupation and destroying and exploiting Palestinian land are missing from this list. Rupert Colville is a spokesperson for the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and tried to understate the importance of this list. Let's have a listen. And we're fully aware of the sensitivity of this report for people on all sides of the debate and for, of course, the companies themselves. And for this reason, we've taken particular care not to go beyond the remit set down for us by the Human Rights Council. It's important to note that it is not, as some claim, a blacklist, nor does it qualify any company's activities as illegal. As we verge on the abyss of a new Israeli government that is hell-bent on officially annexing Palestinian land into Israel, this becomes more than just a list to be boycotted and protested. And we are joined by Real News correspondent Sher Hever who is based in Heidelberg, Germany. His latest book is The Privatization of Israeli Security, published by Pluto Press. And Shia, good to see you here as a guest. Thank you, Mark. So let's talk a bit about this original list. The original list was suppressed by, the, by Israel and U.S., and they tried to stop its publication. Now it's been published, but much revised. So what do we know about the struggle around the publication of this list and about why and who was left off? Uh, well, I was a little bit involved in, in compiling that list uh, among many, many other activists in Israel and Palestine and elsewhere. Um, there's uh, uh, already organizations that are creating databases like this. Most notable of them is Who Profits, uh, which belongs to the Coalition of Women for Peace. And, and anyone can just go and, and browse their website and see more, uh, see hundreds of, of companies listed there. Uh, so the UN ori originally had a, pl a, a list of 400 companies. The thing is uh, that whenever they um, want to put on the agenda of the Human Rights Committee that they want to talk about their findings and present them and effectively publish the list, uh, the, Israel and the U.S. Uh, send their uh, delegates to try to sabotage this and prevent it from being uh, published. And even though both Israel and the United States have actually uh, stepped down from the Human Rights uh, Commission of the Uni United Nations, and uh, they still continue to uh, wield influence and prevent that list from being, or prevented that list from being published until now. Uh, so now we only have 112 companies on the list. The reason that so few uh, companies stayed on the list is because the UN uh, was very trying to to play it as safe as possible. They were terrified of repression by by the United States and Israel. So what they did is they uh, first of all uh, only put companies on the list where they were absolutely sure and had all the information uh, on that company uh, and that they could cross-reference it and prove it. But then they talk to the companies and ask them, do you have anything to say? If you say that you are no longer active in the uh, illegally uh, occupied uh, colonies or, or in the uh, occupied uh, West Bank of Gaza, uh, then we're going to just take you out without checking. So, of course, hundreds of companies then just use that option and said, oh, well, we, we've stopped, uh, regardless of whether they have or haven't. Uh, and so they were taken off the list. And now we only have 112. But so, so now companies like Airbnb and Booking.com are there because they're promoting accommodation in settlements across the West Bank. And there's groups in there like Alstom and Motorola because they're helping build the infrastructure of the occupation. But, but and many of the companies on this list are not international companies, they're actually Israeli companies. And so, you know, we, you just described what just happened, but then there are groups that like Heidelberg Cement um, and Caterpillar, which were left off the list, and Heidelberg Cement in a recent article uh, that I read was, you know, part and parcel of taking apart one village entirely and doing this major excavation, Caterpillar tearing down homes. So how did they get off, left off the list? 
Uh, right. Well, I think the reason that uh, of the 112 companies that are still on the list, the majority of them are actually Israeli companies, is because the Israeli companies, uh, as a rule, didn't bother to answer the Human Rights Committee. Uh, and they just didn't bother to write them back and say, no, we're no longer active, maybe because they knew it's uh, it's going to sound ridiculous if they say they're no longer active when they still have their address listed uh, in illegal <laughs> colonies. Uh, so, so they stay on the list. Uh, and and that creates, I think, a very strong bias because, in fact, if you go, if you travel in the West Bank and you look around you, you will see caterpillar caterpillar bulldozers everywhere. You will see in East, uh, occupied East Jerusalem the tram built by uh, Astom. Uh, you will see uh, a lot of of uh, uh, imported machinery and materials from international companies that are fully aware that they're supporting the occupation. But for these companies, it's very easy to say, we have nothing to do with that. But, but, the question, uh, but, oh, yeah. oh, but sorry, getting to Heidelberg Cement, uh, I, I actually live in Heidelberg. I, I've been to their uh, stock mm -hmm. uh, holder uh, uh, meeting once. Uh, and it's a very interesting story. Heidelberg Cement is a company that uh, keeps insisting that they're on their way out and they're going to sell their illegal quarries in the West Bank, and they're going to stop uh, providing cement and other materials to the Israeli colonies. But Electronic Intifada, the website, has uncovered a document in Hebrew, which I read, uh, that shows that they have extended their license for uh, mining natural resources in the West Bank by another year, meaning that they are intended to keep on doing that. Uh, so this is very surprising that they are not on the list, actually. They, we have absolute proof of that. Um, this is a company that is pillaging Palestinian property, uh, the, the natural resources of Palestine, and pays taxes to the Israeli occupier instead of to the people who, who actually live on that land. So uh, what's interesting to me, when you take this particular story uh, of Heidelberg Cement, uh, I think it was a mini story that was this fascinating article in this about, about a Palestinian village, Al, Al Zawiyah, uh, where they have this huge uh, mine, open open mine pit going on. Heidelberg is running, uh, and so the, the, it begs a lot of questions. A, they're expanding the work, not narrowing the work. There are many other companies involved who are not on these lists doing similar work around in the in the uh, occupied territories. So, and then you have this new Israeli government coming in, as I said earlier, that is hell bent on annexation. So. So this, this, to me, this com complicates the story in, in many ways. Uh, and think about what the response is, because you are talking about companies that are just literally taking away the land. Um, and if they become part of Israel, it changes the nature of what really what, what can really happen. So how do you see this playing out? I mean, I know BDS is calling for a boycott, but in some ways, this might be beyond that. And maybe I'm wrong, but talk about that. Well, officially, the UN uh, is not going as far as calling for a boycott. Uh, they even don't dare to write on the list that what the company is doing is illegal. They're even <laughs> they're trembling in fear, and they're not even writing this very simple fact. Uh, so they're just saying this is a list for your information. Of course, uh, nobody can really see uh, any kind of use for that list except in order to organize boycott, divestment, and sanctions against these against these particular companies. So of course, it has something to do with the BDS movement. The BDS movement is the movement that has now the responsibility to take that list and make use of it. So now it's up to people, for example, myself living in Heidelberg, to protest against Heidelberg Cement and, and what this company is doing. Um, and it is going to play out absolutely as, as a, a international action to make these companies accountable for corporate uh, accountability in, in war crimes. We, uh, the UN has already published lists like this for Myanmar and for uh, the DRC. Uh, and in both cases, they were not so timid about writing, these are companies doing illegal things and, uh, and the, the, these companies uh, uh, maybe should be put on a blacklist rather than just uh, you know, mentioned for, for the information value. Uh, in the case of Israel-Palestine, uh, there is a lot more pressure uh, to, to uh, keep the UN, but uh, to, to keep the UN quiet, but, but the activists are not going to keep quiet. And I think the companies uh, should be aware that there's going to be a heavy economic price to pay when these companies become the pariahs, the companies that cross a, a red line, violate international law. Uh, some companies have already been severely burned. Uh, like Veolia, the French infrastructure company, 
that uh, lost uh, billions of, of dollars worth of contracts all around the world because of their involvement in illegal activity in, in East, occupied East Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, now these companies uh, on, on that list, these 112 companies are facing a similar fate. And I think beyond that, we have other companies that didn't get to the list, like for example, Hyderabad Cement, uh, that uh, are also going to be held accountable. So as we close this out, she had one quick question here. What really, when a sidebar interested me about this. When I read Heidelberg's, what Heidelberg said about their work uh, in, the, in certain villages in the West Bank and, and in, in, in Palestine, and when I read about General Mills' statement, uh, which said, look, we hire Israeli and Palestinian workers at the same, at the same rate uh, for the same pay, the same benefits, the same thing Heidelberg said, and it reminded me of what goes on in many indigenous reservations uh, and territories in the United States, like Peabody Coal among the Navajo and the Hopi, where they are exploiting the land, uh, and a story we're working on here for Real News, are exploiting the land uh, and destroying the land, but at the same time, they're giving Navajo and Hopi men and women work that's paying them more than they've ever been paid before. The same thing is happening with Heidelberg and General Mills. So how does that fit into the mix? I mean, that doesn't, I mean, because that's also a reality about how people have to survive. Right. Th thank you for asking that, because I think there is a difference. The difference is that uh, the companies are outright lying. They are not just providing jobs for Palestinians because officially, according to the Israeli law, Palestinian workers working in the illegal colonies uh, working for international or Israeli companies are supposed to receive the same conditions and the same pay as Israeli workers. They are supposed to be protected by Israeli labor laws. The problem is that no employer actually enforces that. And the courts don't enforce that either. Uh, when it gets to the court, and it gets to the court frequently, there is an organization called Kavla Oved, or Workers Hotline, um, which uh, specializes in representing Palestinian workers in court. And they, and when Palestinians don't receive the minimum wage, don't, don't receive health benefits, don't receive the basic insurance that they're supposed to receive, then they can go to court and the court usually, and, and then the company would argue, oh, but you're actually subject to Jordanian labor laws, not to Israeli labor law. Uh, and even though the court has repeatedly said, this is not acceptable, uh, and uh, the Israeli uh, laws uh, are, are, uh, um, should, should be in effect, there is no sanction. And the companies can continue to violate again and again, and nothing really happens to them. Uh, so that's a, a structural problem with the way that Palestinians are treated in these, in these uh, companies. Uh, and the amount of money that they have lost because of that over the years is tremendous. Starting from 2008, the Israeli government even imposes a special Palestinian-only tax. In order to discourage Palestinians from working uh, for Israeli companies, they take a, a, an almost 50% tax on their income. In order, and, and then they, they give that money to the Palestinian Authority. They give it to the government so that the workers will not see the money. And then they say, well, it's not a real tax because we didn't take the money for ourselves. But the result is to try to create a um, segregated workforce or a Jewish only workforce and to keep Palestinians as second rate workers wherever they go. And unfortunately, that is, that is working. That is something that these companies are complicit in when they allow this system to work and when they agree to pay this racist tax, a, a Palestinian only tax. Um, but I, I wanna say one last thing about this. Okay. Because the companies have often said, uh, if, you, um, if you sanction us, if you boycott us, we will fire the Palestinian workers. We, we're providing work for Palestinians and uh, they, they need that work. So you're actually harming Palestinians, don't boycott us. This is an argument that is in a, essentially taking the Palestinian workers hostage. It's telling the Palestinian workers, if we are human rights activists, we care about international law, we see a company uh, that is violating their rights, and we say, oh, but, but we don't want to uh, boycott that company because uh, they're providing jobs for Palestinians. What we're actually saying, oh, you Palestinians, you don't know what's good for you. We know better uh, uh, than you do what is good for you because uh, even though all labor unions in Palestine support the BDS movement, support the boycott, uh, we're going to, to ignore all that and just decide uh, for ourselves what is what is your interest. It's just an extremely patronizing and racist approach, and of course, uh, I do not support it. Well, sure, there, there, there's so much more to talk about here, and there's a larger piece of the story that we have to continue talking about because the annexation and more that could be taking place and how that fits in, but we'll be doing that together. Sure, thanks for your work, and thanks for joining us once again 
Talk to you very thank soon. You, thank you. And I'm Mark Stanley here for The Real News Network. I want to thank you all for joining us. Let us know what you think. Take care. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.